Okay, we're going to start with our uh, very uh, last panel of the day. Um, and actually, it's uh, after that mesmerizing and absolutely fascinating presentation, I'm surprised that so many of you are here, which only tells me that uh, you're obviously hungry for more, and we want more at this point. So sorry for having this so late in the day, but this seems like the perfect time to engage with uh, questions of theory. And I, I actually, before I begin, introduce myself. I am uh, Shubhra Gururani. I am a faculty member of the Department of Anthropologists, Anthropology and uh, I think if I'm not wrong, I'm the lone anthropologist in this whole uh, project. Is that right, Roger? I think I am. And given that, I'm standing in this panel talking about new geographies, given that anthropologists have been always fa fascinated with margins and uh, new geographies. Uh, so today the panel, uh, not a panel, it's a uh, round table that uh, I organized. And in fact, uh, that was the easiest yeah, the easiest part of the uh, job to put this uh, uh, round table together, as somebody just said, to put together the rock stars of urban theory in front of you. So I'm just the choreographer who's put together this uh, wonderful panel in front of you, and most of whom do not need uh, any in introduction. Um, but I just want to say that uh, it is in a spir the spirit of discussion and not with seeking some kind of solutions and answers to any question, but just to open uh, uh, dialogue and uh, conversations amongst ourselves and think about what we think of theory. And the fact that the panel, this uh, round table comes at the end of the day, says something about theory. At the end of the day, we don't beginning with theory because it's quite clear now that big ideas, big theories are not holding us together. It is something things have fallen apart, as Chinua Achebe said many uh, five decades back, and clearly, we are no longer at ease. We are no longer at ease with uh, urban theory. We are no longer at ease with the uh, production of knowledge. And we have to rethink uh, what would that theory look like and what would be those sites of emergent conceptualization. And it is in this uh, uh, sort of uh, spirit of thinking of no longer at ease with urban theory and with productions of knowledge that uh, this round table has come together or I have brought it together, or forced them to be here this time of the day. And just to some of the things which I was thinking, and I've put together some questions which uh, the presenters were posed to, and they don't necessarily don't have to stick to them. But something which has become increasingly clear over the last uh, couple of days is that we are at a new moment, as Robin Bloch was insisting that this is a new moment, and as Ananya Roy has said, this is a moment of interruption. And this is a moment of interruption for which we have to seek new vocabularies. We are quite familiar with the existing logics and the, uh, and the stories of the past. We know, as Robert Fishman wonderfully presented, what happened at the past. But what is going to come? As Alan Mabry was saying, what would be the future of, can you imagine what the cities would look like? What, would, what are the vocabularies? What are the vernacularisms we can generate? And that is a question we have. And I don't think any one of us really have ans answers, but what would that look like? And what kind of uh, post-colonial, anti-racist, feminist uh, methods we have to think about theory at, that, at this particular uh, juncture? And I think that's what, in that spirit, that we are thinking about some of these questions. And as an anthropologist, we of course start with case studies, and what we have seen is many case studies. And these case studies, this empiricism, these descriptions and stories are very rich, very interesting. And, but what to do with them? How to make, bring them into conversation and how to generate some kind of analytic, analytical frameworks is a challenge in front of us. But more than that, when we have case studies, how do they gel together, or do they even gel together? Can we actually think of a, some kind of a global urban theory? In that sense, so far we've talked about suburbanisms, so this panel is thinking about the, the other part of suburbanisms, the global part of it. What exactly is global when you think of suburbanisms? So that's where I'm going to leave it and ask uh, Solly Benjamin to air. Uh, Solly Benjamin is a professor, a long-time planner who's written extensively on questions of urban politics, urbanisms in, uh, in India, South Asia. Uh, he was a professor at the University of Toronto and has been, is now in uh, Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. And uh, Solly has been thinking of these questions for the longest time. And uh, Solly, could you just come and uh, share your thoughts on the topic? Or you can be sitting there if you want. Um, 
going to try to use this uh, unstable computer because of my jet lag and the mic at the same time. Uh, well, uh, I know we're all sort of exhausted at the end of the day, so I'll, be, I'll try to be as crisp as possible. Uh, thank you, Shubhra, for inviting us all. And um, I'll just make a couple of points. We've been giving sort of five minutes, which is a good idea. Um, I think one, um, what I'd like to, uh, when I sort of uh, put these down uh, quite fast, uh, uh, sort of yesterday, is the, I think we should, we should not be um, driven by uh, uh, anxiety of trying to have a global meta theory. And I think that would sort of repeat um, the problems of uh, uh, what we have, sort of quote unquote theory coming from North America, Europe, which is also trying to be global and sort of trying to shift the pendulum on the other side would uh, just recreate those mistakes. And I think there are some conversations that came out yesterday uh, with Mari Lenzera and some of the other people. And I think the, the danger in that sort of seeking the globalist, uh, globalness of it, excuse my jet lag, um, is that it would really sort of depoliticize that process because we would lose the sense of uh, grain uh, that we've seen in several of the presentations. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Shruti's work in Delhi, uh, which um, tell you about how power gets structured uh, on the ground, how it is contested, and how often it is opaque um, and illegible uh, because of uh, that itself is a sort of political space. So I feel that what one needs is more nuances. And um, to quote from Lisa P.T. where um, the value of those kind of detailed case studies is that that's how you understand um, what uh, becomes certain uh, uh, conceptual frames, uh, ways of thinking about um, uh, the way cities transform, the way how uh, people are politicized, uh, how they're controlled. And um, having said that, I think um, some of the conceptual lens, lenses which uh, I have, I don't know, personally found useful, everyone has their own sort of uh, twist, uh, which I found useful not just uh, sort of coming from Bangalore into Toronto, but coming into Toronto is, uh, for example, um, uh, we had a presentation yesterday which was talking about basement apartments in the in Toronto itself. And I remember when I first moved here and living with my cousin, uh, he was also doing up his apartment. And uh, he told me about the grandfathering clause in the lease agreement, which, uh, and I'm mentioning this because uh, this refers to certain forms of ways of working territory, ways of working land, uh, land tenure, uh, which I suspect are useful ways of looking across borders, across regions. Uh, it doesn't ghettoize you, but it tells you about how people work a certain system, whether it's a bureaucratic system, which is not a dead system, but quite alive, always it gets politicized. So I think that's one. Then today, Alan made a point about, in a presentation about uh, understanding different ways of metro management, and uh, which I feel has been uh, an important change or shift over the last uh, 10 years, uh, uh, 1998 or 9 in Toronto, 2005 in Bangalore, uh, somewhat similar date lines in Delhi. So I think these are, uh, uh, these are kind of uh, uh, frames which we could use to uh, think across borders. Uh, not again in a meta way, but really trying to uh, uh, learn from particular contexts. Um, quick kind of, I made a quick listing of five areas of, uh, uh, of, of sort of uh, elements that we could think of. Um, I think one is uh, usually treated land as a very passive setting. And why I have found land and land tenure important is because um, it goes beyond a kind of functional uh, element of uh, policy program developmentalism. 
but rather looks at how people engage with these quite often imposed politics uh, of policy and programs and to uh, find their own spaces. Uh, this also becomes important because I think one thing that we're realizing in more recent work is that uh, you can't even talk about cities as a homogeneous unit because different parts of it operate with very different logics and not necessarily as a quote-unquote resistance to large capital. Um, if you take Bangalore, the IT, there, are, there is other stuff happening. Of course, it may form a opposition to it, but it's not framed as a resistance. And I'm particularly mentioning this because something I just mentioned, I mean, I'll be exploring tomorrow, is some of the critiques of special economic zones, for instance, um, uh, progressive critiques, actually fall into the logic of what was promoting the special, log uh, special economic zones in the first place. So the problem with some of the ways of thinking about um, resistance is that uh, it, it starts taking on the logic what it's seeking to resist and therefore a narrowing of politics. In contrast, I think when we try to um, look at the occupation of land, how it's mobilized, and the different logics, we discover other, other ways of being which are not necessarily uh, expected out of uh, uh, large, uh, large uh, capital. Um, I'll just say a couple of more points. Um, I think uh, what what's we're also wi witnessing is uh, going across discipline and especially coming from and being trained as an urban planner type. Uh, some time ago is, uh, and I'll just talk about myself and other people will talk, is uh, really to think about uh, not just the rule of law but the social construction of law and institutions. Uh, I think that's something again interesting because once you assume a rule of law across boundaries, that itself becomes hegemonic conceptually. And linked to that, um, I was just wondering whether we could start to construct narratives which don't have the following words. This again came out in a discussion last evening. So the words I listed are, uh, you may or may not agree, slums, informal sector, poor, like the poor, patron clientelism, rowdy cheaters and other violent actors, unplanned development and chaos, as well as, I would put it, inclusive growth, because if you're hung up with growth, then you got us stuck in this kind of inclusive category. And also participatory planning. Now, this might come, the last one might sort of be depressing and be dejected, but I think in a lot of forums where we've talked about, for example, the World Bank CDS being imposed in Bangalore, uh, quite a few people rejected the terms, in fact even rejected being in the room, apart from also being excluded in, from the room where the participation was supposed to happen. But they weren't too unhappy about being excluded because they had other forums to work in a more stealth-like way to... Uh, so I'm just trying to give you a sense that uh, maybe we need to be careful with where we get these terms and uh, like peri-urban, for example, I, I was thinking today is really like a planning category which we are imposing on, on other ways of being and therefore we uh, run the risk of uh, sort of ourselves being implicated in a uh, depoliticizing process. So I think that's one thing as academics and activists we have to watch out for because the terms we use get mobilized in a different way. And um, yeah, I think I'll stop at that and hand it over well, to our order. Well, it's goes back to Madam Chair. Yeah, discipline. Three very normatives. We're going to go alphabetically, and that's uh, Roger Kyle, who needs no introduction. Really? Yeah. That's probably the first time since my grade school days that I was second for the alphabet. Um, I. Um, these are the rock stars, I'm the impresario. I muscled myself, as I said yesterday, onto this panel because I, had, I have no slot in this entire conference where I can say a few substantive things. 
this is it. I have five minutes. And I like those words, global and suburban, so much, I put them about 17 times into this title. <laughs> and this is where it starts. Um, you know, you've seen this all. Uh, this is, I think, from Nature or PNAS, so one of those uh, scientific um, journals. Scientists have now discovered, because they like to count things and uh, draw up beautiful maps, that we've now discovered we're urban and that has consequences for us. They, and we knew this, but the scientists have now also discovered this. I think that there's a truth to that. I mean, you can do an ideology critique the way uh, Neil Brenner and uh, Christian Schmidt are doing this, which is fine. But I also think it's true that all, everything those scientists are saying is true. Uh, we are becoming more urban. This, and Africa and China are taking the brunt of it. Um, that is sort of... These are truisms now, and here are some of the consequences in just 18 years. In 2030, it is expected that urbanized land in the planet will cover 1.2 million square kilometers, twice as much as 12 years ago in 2000. That is significant, whatever you think about it. Unequal distribution with China and Africa absorbing the lion's share of global urbanization, and that has huge consequences. Um, and the last quote here makes that clear. The results of many local scale studies highlights the need to understand the aggregate impact of urban expansion, land cover, change on biodiversity at the global scale. You know that the uh, world's smartest pointy heads have just published this report yesterday. We're all about to die. And it is true. Uh, and uh, I, from now on, will only treat you not to scientific information, but only literature. This is from one of my favorite recent novels called Nikolsky, uh, written by a Montreal author, won all kinds of prizes. This is the English version. I don't, won't treat you to my French. But here is a fictional character that says, the clientele of the Poissonniere Shanahan at Montreal's Jean Talon Market is by and large made up of suburbanites from Laval des Rapides, Chambdé, and, uh, and Duvernay. But one should not be fooled by the innocuous demeanor of these predators. According to some estimates, the bluefin tuna population in the Atlantic has declined by 87% since 1970, a rate that matches quite closely the expansion of the suburbs over the same time period. It can thus be deduced, this is the fishmonger, Malo, Malo, concludes that suburban development is very much in step with the movement of the tuna shoals. Um, so that is all true. There's nothing to be debated about that. This is absolutely correct. Uh, what are we going to make of it? Well, that is up to us. And this is the next example from literature. This is uh, David Mitchell's uh, novel, The Thousand Autumns of Jakob de Zut, uh, which is a fantastic novel if you haven't read it. It deals mostly, 90% of this novel takes place on this little island there at the, uh, I think there is a pointer there. Anyway, the little island there in the front, uh, which is in the Bay of Nagasaki, um, which the, the Dutch put into that bay to, to, to uh, negotiate and treat with, uh, to deal with uh, the Japanese who didn't let the Europeans onto the Japanese islands. So all the business was taken care of in that what I would call insular suburb of Nagasaki. And that was for about 250 years, from the 17th to the 19th century. And th it, this suburban island did two things. It negotiated global relationships at a global scale between uh, Japan and the rest of the world at eye level, as the Japanese were not uh, being colonized. And at the same time, it negotiated internal relationships in the suburb, in, on this island of Dejima, as the many different peoples that were there, people and peoples, uh, the slaves that, that were there, the, the Dutch people that uh, owned the slaves, the American adventurers, anybody who was then in the known world was on this island. So what that island did is what Mississauga and Brampton do today, uh, to find some sort of accord uh, between the different people that have been swept up into these suburbs. So right from the start of modernity, the, the suburb is global, and the global is suburban. One more slide, one more quote, also from David Mitchell, different novel. Uh, this takes place in 1974. It is in the, uh, uh, the community of Buenas Yerbas, uh, uh, which is San Diego by any other name. And here, the observation is made after 13th Street. 
The city loses its moneyed Pacific character. Carrot trees watered by the city give way to buckled streetlights. Joggers do not pant down these side streets. The neighborhood could be from any manufacturing zone in any industrial belt. Bums doze on benches. Weeds crack the sidewalks. Skins get darker block by block. Flyers cover barricaded doors. Graffiti spreads across every surface below the height of a teenager holding a spray can. The garbage collectors are on strike again, and mounds of rubbish putrefy in the sun. Pawn shops, nameless laundromats, and grocers scratch a lean living from threadbare pockets. After more blocks and streetlights, the shops give way to anonymous manufacturing firms and housing projects. Luisa has never even driven through this district and feels unsettled by the unknowability of cities. I know each one of you could have a two-hour lecture on this little text. I don't want to you know, uh, take it apart for its racializing language and all that. That's not the point here. The point here is that last point, which is the unknowability of cities. And these are the two conundrums we have, is that uh, despite Ananya's call for a break, uh, a f uh, you know, a fraction in, our, in the way we now look at things, there have been continuities that haven't been explained yet and that have always been crowded out by other stories that we tell ourselves. At the same time as we tell ourselves these stories, we are still swimming in that large sea of unknowability of cities. And I think I want to keep it there. Thank you very much. Shubra for organizing uh, this and also for giving us some questions to um, think about. Uh, one of which uh, is indeed uh, the question, is global urban theory possible? And I, I don't know, I have no clue. Uh, and I would agree with Professor Benjamin that maybe we uh, sh don't have to worry too much about that. I uh, do think, though, we do, do we, that we do need theory, and we do need theories that can give us methodologies that can help us understand and critique the worldwide dimensions of various kinds of phenomena, including urbanization. Uh, because urbanization has uh, not typically been, in world history, a phenomenon restricted to local national or continental um, scales. Um, the particular challenge remains to try and establish, not to use the word global for everything, but to establish the particular weight and particular characteristics of worldwide scales of activities relative to other ones and the relative weight and characteristics of the worldwide de will depend, of course, on context. To deal with this problem is really not a new problem. It is a problem that has shaped debates uh, over the last many decades in various fields, in comparative political economy, in historical sociology, in um, debates about debates in cultural studies, in transnational historical materialism, and, and various other fields. There are, of course, new things, and, and this conference is about discussing some new uh, world historic shifts, shifts in geopolitics, shifts in production, shifts in the geographical centers of urbanization, the ones that we've seen over the last half century, the ones that um, have really reshaped fundamentally um, how and where urbanization takes place. Another reason why the, the old methodolog methodological problem that I raised is posed in new ways simply has to do with the coming to the fore of a new round of debate about Eurocentrism 
there have been many previous rounds, but the new round, the one that emerged in the 1980s and 90s with the rise of post-colonialism. So I don't have solutions to this except to perhaps just throw out a couple of uh, things that I've always liked as useful methodological suggestions. Uh, one is Harry Herutunian's notion of co-evil processes and practices. He discusses in his work on Japan and in interwar period, modernity as a co-evil um, phenomenon, a regime of time, a temporal regime of the new that you can detect in various parts of the world, um, but in different ways. So co the coeval character of modernity is one where modernity is contemporaneous with other such experiences, but also interconnected to those other experiences. And so one can say that urbanity as a very minimal notion of centrality and difference is something that one can detect in various ways around the world. It's a, a very minimal uh, uh, formal definition in a sense. Uh, but one can detect in different parts of the world uh, in different ways and in ways that are also differently connected to each other. How to develop an understanding of coeval, the coeval character of the urban Again, there's a lot of debates about notions of relational comparison, the work of Philip McMichael, the work of Jill Hart, and also the work of our colleague here at York, who is not here, Radhika Mongia, who has used the term co-production co to, to, to try and fi figure out a way of understanding the ways in which transnational, worldwide processes relate to other scales of activity co-producing particular phenomenon in particular places. And that phenomenon of co-production, of course, again, will, will, will be different depending on the subject of analysis, but also depending on the context that you're looking at. Now, there's always some pitfalls in global research projects, I irrespective of, of, of projects on the global and world, on the worldwide. And let me just highlight two. Uh, and those, those pitfalls have to do really more with the politics of research. They're not just a question of the content of theory. There are two related pitfalls. One is the pitfall of the privilege of ignorance. And the other one is really the other side of the coin, which is the temptation of research as a possessive activity. Uh, uh, the first and both of these these uh, pitfalls, uh, of course, you can find typically together in imperial cultures, the cultures of knowledge production of the old colonial empires, but also the, uh, the practices of knowledge production within the imperial networks that we participate in, the one that is still defined by US America and the English language. Um, and it's not easy to find answers to, to the, these pitfalls and, and, and the forces that, that shape them, even more so because today we are living in a university system in the Anglo-American world, at least, speaking for myself here, that um, is shaped more than ever by a kind of a frenzied pace of entrepreneurialism and by a much more, a more general speed up of academic labor processes. And uh, that is not typically conducive to um, careful research. And so there may be a few things perhaps to think about in terms of addressing these issues. I don't, nobody has recipes, I think, to deal with them, but let me throw out a few. Uh, first, the possibility of slow research. Can we have a slow research movement? A moratorium on publication <laughs> or something? I don't know. Um, the question of multipolarity. What would be a world where knowledge is organized along multiple social and geographical poles of concentration? Not that each pole develops their own theory, but where control of the terms and parameters of research are defined 
in those polls themselves rather than elsewhere. Third, the question of non-identity, the perennial question from Adorno, the imperative of thinking of the non-identity or the partial non-identity between concept and the world, which is not just a methodological question. It is a question that, that infuse, should infuse research with a certain kind of humility to say, the task of theory is not to grasp everything. It's not to mimic the complexity of the world in order to dominate and control it. It is to inject critical questions and methodologies that can highlight aspects of the reality without wanting to have it all and eat it, right? Um, and of course, all of this ultimately has to do with a very fundamental question, which is, well, how do researchers relate to others? What are the kinds of relationships that we as researchers construct with non-researchers? Do we research up or down, to use a term that my colleague Ray Rogers uses all the time with his students? And how do these relationships that we build have to do, what do they have to do with power in its various manifestations? So I'll leave it at that. I hope, good evening everybody. Thank you for the privilege of, uh, of being here. Uh, I'm quite humbled to be a part of this company. Um, I was delighted with the way Shubra used the phrase, no longer at ease, in introducing our discussion, a phrase used of course as the title of a wonderful novel by a late fabulous African novelist who also wrote a book for the, with the title Things Fall Apart. Uh, I shall not continue to quote W.B. Yeats in the direction of mere anarchy. Um, I guess we're engaged in a search to express just some of what seem to us vital features of the urban question in these times. Of course, I have no illusions about exhausting that subject, let alone realizing what Kian Tajbaksh in his wonderful book called The Promise of the City. My own method includes, uh, perhaps as Colin McFarlane puts it, comparison that might be conceived as a strategy of indirect and uncertain learning. But perhaps because I have worked reasonably equally in several cities on three continents, which include Europe as well as Latin America and Africa, I tend to doubt that what will make things more clear is, as MacFarlane writes, transformation in a predominantly Euro-American orientated urban theory. And I say that because I think the matters before us are not purely matters of the world of ideas. They are matters of materiality. They are matters of distributions. Let us uh, compare the population distribution of the world today with a projection over roughly the next four decades. And let's just think about what that might suggest to us as where the weight of slow research in the urban might most appropriately be concentrated and where the, may I say, resources, institutions and minds might most appropriately be concentrated. And let us perhaps then look at another contrast. 
between the present distribution of population in the world and the countries of residence of authors of so-called scientific publications. I think those simple, although very hard to construct and therefore inaccurate maps tell us something. And I think it is, amongst other things, including the intellectual challenges, which are profound, I think it is the institutional and material, as well as social questions, which lie before us. To illustrate, what you see is a map of where the university, which is most habitually nowadays ranked number one in the world, has its branch plants. You see a little red dot at Cambridge, Massachusetts, and you see the branch plants around the world. Now, imagine the dot were purple and situated in Bangalore and the flows of ideas, of people, of graduate students, of publications were slowly, perhaps, in some other directions. Those maps, colleagues, to me, crudely, perhaps, represent where some of the problems lie. My uh, guess is part of our role as a person who lives in what uh, I hope Roger will forgive me for saying, a person who lives in the suburban reaches of the academic world. My role is to challenge those distributions. And I know I share that with people who inhabit other spaces which are sometimes just as southern when situated in Oakland, California, or Saint-Denis, in Neuf Trois, in the Paris region, as they might be in Soweto, or the other well-known symbols of the Global South. So perhaps there would be little future for urban theory in a world where urbanization has been generalized, to quote Neil Brenner. But even if the planet were entirely urban, theorizing the city would still have to deal with difference. Simply, diversity of the urban and what difference such diversity makes for society. To ignore that would inter alia be to miss the value of post-colonial theorizing. Yet the notion that the world is all urban denies the experience of places that are not like Manhattan and of many who dwell and labor there, whose social units stretch across surprising spaces. Malik Simone, Johnny Steinberg, and others provide marvelous illustrations. Thus, Brenner's thesis that the concept of urbanization requires systematic reinvention invites, for me, translation into continuous and diverse reinvention, as well as in specific identification of the transitory and more durable and perhaps elusive common, commonality. City scholarship will continue to enter less as well as more fruitful avenues. A pure southern take will not resolve the problems of an arrogant, well-resourced, and purely northern one, nor will one single group entirely succeed in drawing into connection the extent of contemporary urbanisms, crossing language, disciplinary, conceptual, and all other sorts of boundaries is essential, yet will remain in Bob Beauregard's wonderful phrase, unavoidably incomplete. But the pleasure, perhaps, lies in the engagement.
Uh, hello, everybody. Good evening. Thank you so much, Shubra, for inviting me onto this panel. I have to confess, though, that I didn't read your questions until after I'd read this piece, so, so please bear with me. Um, I want to ask then, so what about urban forms and urban lives beyond the very simple but essential point that more and more of the world's population live in areas we define as urban and suburban? And that the increase in urbanization that we're witnessing now and in the immediate future is largely through the growth of impoverished cities, which will constitute much of poverty reduction's geographical future, and central to which are women in the global south. I briefly mentioned yesterday that the kind of city that we can imagine depends upon what kind of people we want to be and what kind of theorists we are. And I have an interest in how feminists generate knowledge that's about, it's concerned with radical reconfigurations of kinship, of desire, of distributions of work, relations of public and private, and a recognition of a life beyond commodification. Western feminist critiques of urban theory started in the late 70s, the heyday of the Marxist theories of Poulantzas, Althusser, and Castells. It's when I started my PhD. It was incredibly scary. Um, but there was this wonderful book, of course, in 1983 by Castells, A City and the Grassroots. And what stood out for me about that book was that women were very much present, at least in the beginning of the book. Castells was acutely aware of the role that women played in street protests, in community mobilizations. But by the end of the book, please go back and read it, women are totally absent. So while he recognized the radical subjectivity of women, their utility for theory production was zero. Much more recently, Ashar Min and Nigel Thrift, in their ambitious attempt in 2002 to reimagine the urban, said that they conceived of their book as a kind of staging post towards a different practice of urban theory based on the transhuman rather than the human, the distantiated rather than the proximate, the distance rather than the placed, and the intransitive rather than the reflexive. Unfortunately, they also noted, we do not have the space to cover issues of gender, race, and the environment, and equally it's cities in the north that we have in mind when writing this book. Obviously, there's still a need for vigilance. There is, I'm afraid, a regularity with which some critical urban theorists dismiss women. Women who fall away from, who are, who, or are not allowed for within studies of the urban also fall away from conceptualizations of political possibilities. And they will be abandoned to the requirements of capital accumulation. And I want to argue it's a double indignity because some women can and do fall away from sight in the urban, from fear, from violence, from exhaustion. And at the same time, they're the objects of the epistemic violence of their dismissal from the realm of theory. And now, in 2013, we are being asked to entertain the intentionally provocative analytical framing of planetary urbanism. And to me, it's in some ways a return to Castells because it's seeing the urban again as the theoretical object of study. It's not the theoretical object that the Castells noted, the, spatial, the city is a spatial unit of collective consumption, but the city is everything as a generalized planetary condition. So to quote Neil, Neil Brenner, it's the uneven stretching of an urban fabric over the entire world economy. The urban has become a generalized planetary condition in and through which the accumulation of capital, the continuous enclosure of common spaces and realms, the regulation of political economic life, the reproduction of everyday social relations, and the contestation of the earth and humanity's possible futures are simultaneously organized and fought out." End of quote. And indeed, I would agree that the concept of the urban has saturated 
our understanding of the contemporary. So as I stand here as the new director of the City Institute, I suppose I should be happy that so much attention is being paid to the urban. And I would agree, we have to be able to read the countryside in the urban, the suburban in the urban, the national in the urban, the colonial in the urban, and so on. But where is the constitutive outside if the urban is now the planetary condition through which we understand human life and progress? Where does this saturation, for example, place the rural? Can the rural be now only understood in relation to the urban? And would that by default render it not contemporary, not modern, not fit for purpose? Or, as Ananya has pointed out in her recent article in the journal City, if we understand the project of deconstruction and its emphasis on a constitutive outside, as being concerned not with dialectical negation, urban, rural, but with the undecidability of the subject's constitution, then is there a place within this analytical framing of planetary urbanism for a consideration of this undecidability? Chantal Mouffe, quoted in Ananya's article, states that the undecidability of the city's existence is always a function of the symbol of something exceeding it. In planetary urbanism, what exceeds the urban when the urban is now the planetary condition? In addition, I'm also aware that it's, in its all-encompassing ubiquity, this concept of planetary urbanism is, to me, echoing that very brashly confident phrasing of the UN. Pick up any publication today from the UN and you would be hard pressed not to recognize that we're in the 21st century of the city, which is a neoliberal code for the ways in which city life, um, the problems of city life can be addressed by enterprising individuals, for that read mostly women, who can yoke themselves to the incentives of financialized development. Of course, that slogan of the 21st century of the city and the concept of planetary urbanism are different. One attempts to make capitalism our urban salvation, and the other makes capitalism our urban explanance. But both of them, I think, in attempting to address global conditions, are in danger of forgetting that they are particular ways of looking at the urban, what Asha Min has referred to as telescopic urbanisms. But I suspect that planetary urbanism has the analytical sophistication to risk becoming another hegemonic territorial imaginary. At the very least, I hope there's space for women in planetary urbanism. And of course, feminists could be more outraged by these theoretical developments if it wasn't for our own troubled history of insufficiently disrupting the passage of feminist analysis into its neoliberal double, and of still representing women in the global south as victims of economic and patriarchal forces beyond their control. Writing in 2003, Chandra Talpadi Mahanti drew on her very influential critique of this tendency within feminist scholarship to argue that feminists are still persisting with very simplified feminine characters that are far too easily scripted into masculinist and enduringly Eurocentric readings of urbanization. This is a real obdurate process, and one that I've recently argued, as I think the biggest challenge to rethinking feminist interventions into the urban, that the neoliberal urban is still primarily represented in relation to this geographical imaginary of the global north and south, in which the south is primarily understood in terms of developmentalism. Of course, where one theorizes from is hugely important. And David Harvey, back in 2000, argued that our ability to create new geographies is hampered or enabled by three aspects of our intellectual engagements where we can see geography from, how far we can see, 
and where we can learn geography from. Of course, from different vantage points, you focus on different things, different criticisms, criticisms are relevant, and there can be varying interpretations of, that can open up political possibilities. It's, what I'm talking about is variously conceived as situated knowledges or situated ethics, and it's a very important starting point for the kinds of conversations that can build solidarities across difference and for reimagining new categories and political possibilities. And I think we need that kind of very vigorous scrutiny and debate that comes with divergent viewpoints as we chase down the implications of our own and others' positions, first of all, to disrupt these hackneyed scripts of feminism that have been criticized by Mohanty and to belie any simple interpretation of the instrumentalism of millennial development. We also need an epistemological framing that allows for undecidability, for unknowability. And I think these are the challenges that face the generation of urban feminist knowledge that supports the development of progressive political subjects before they fall away. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. It seems a bit of a travesty to speak in the name of theory with a capital T after that gorgeous film. Or another way of putting it, for me, that film and the stories that it told count as theory with a capital T. So I want to make two points today reflecting on the provocation that Shubra has presented to us. I want to reflect on this idea of new geographies of urban theory, and I also want to reflect on the idea of the global, but particularly in relation to the analytical category of suburb. The phrase, New geographies of theory has, of course, been used in many ways. I used that phrase several years ago in an essay that I wrote for regional studies, and I used that phrase primarily in two ways. I used that phrase partly as a way of signaling what I thought was a stark disjuncture between the sheer material reality of urbanism, urbanization, and urban growth, and the Euro-American center of the canon of urban theory. And that disconnect was quite striking for me as I sought for theories, again with a capital T, to take with me into the many parts of the world where I do field work. And none of those toolkits seemed to suffice to make sense of the urban experience that I was struggling to study. But that disconnect is actually not just a disconnect between where the world's urban population will live and the heartland of theory, but in fact something much more profound, which Alan Mabin has already pointed to this evening. Uh, I want to quote a friend, Carlos Weiner, who works out of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, who I also know is a friend of Alan's. And Carlos always reminds us of the uneven ownership of the means of the production of knowledge. And I think that is the context within which we do our academic work, even in a brilliantly transnational and multipolar project as global suburbanisms. But the second issue that I wanted to raise with that idea of new geographies of urban theory was to think about the locatedness of all theory. My argument was not that theories emanating from the Euro-American heartland could not explain what was happening in the global south. No, theory travels. But as Edward Said argued many years ago, we need to pay attention to the conditions under which theory travels and the conditions under which theory in its messiness is received. Like Linda, I come to this place from a place of feminism. Um, particularly perhaps the writings of Adrian Rich, who asks us to think about the politics of location. Adrian Rich in her essays would often talk about how to speak 
is to speak from a place on the map. So my argument for a while now has been that all theory is parochial. All knowledge is parochial, but some kinds of knowledge travel as universal knowledge. They acquire the status of theory with a capital T, while other kinds of knowledge seem to remain confined to their geographies, often understood as ethnography with a small e, cute and anecdotal. So I've been very interested in, in breaking down this debilitating divide between something called theory and something called ethnography, something that masquerades as universal and something that is only taken up as parochial or provincial. And this is, of course, what the Komarovs also outline in their wonderful book, Theory from the South. So one question then for us in, this, in the context of the Global Suburbanisms Project is to think about the geography of a term like suburb. That if all concepts have a geography, have a parochial geography lurking in their histories, how then do we do a genealogy and a genealogy attentive to the sort of parochial geography of the term suburb. And I think it's important for us to repeatedly ask this question because I'm reminded at each AAG that I attend how often one has to stage that interruption and disruption in our script of theory. That each time we think that post-colonialism or feminism have been taken up as interventions at the next AAG, the forgetting has already happened. Right? So how then do we force ourselves to do as constant labor that genealogical work? But I also want to turn to the second issue that Shubra has posed for us, which is how does the global figure in all of this? So part of what is at stake in thinking about theory as inevitably located, as speaking from a place on the map, is to consider the geog geographic signifiers of theory. And Linda has already given us an important critique of the term planetary as a particular geographic signifier of theory. Now, of course, the most hegemonic theories travel without geographic signifier. But what does it mean to use global as a particular geographic signifier of theory? For me, the global signifies today not so much the globalization of everything as it does a particular uneven geography. And I've been drawn to a certain understanding of, of the global which is tied to the concept of the global south. And here I'm thinking about the global south not as the southern hemisphere, not as the places in the world where the world's urban population will live, but in the terms of Matthew Spark, as a concept metaphor that is everywhere but always somewhere to signify a relationality, not a location. And that relationality for me is very interesting, especially in relation to the term suburb. So if we put global and suburb together, as has this project, what then does the geographic signifier of theory mean? And for me, in the new work that I'm starting this year, it has meant something very specific. It has meant thinking about a rearranged world order, one in which global north and global south are not where they once used to be and are not what they once used to be. So, of course, we are looking at the sustained crisis, economic and political, of the liberal democracies of the North Atlantic. That the Great Recession has turned out to be a drastic restructuring of the American economy, but also that the Eurozone is an existential crisis. While we also see the great new hegemonic formations of economic prosperity in the Global South. Hall, Massey and Rustin in their new manifesto after neoliberalism describe this as a tectonic shift of economic power. Specifically, what I've been interested in is that if my colleague at Berkeley, Loic Wakant, talks about America as, the, as an experiment in the future of neoliberal insecurity, I'm interested in how in the Global South, there is in fact grand and ambitious experiments with the future of human development, 
with the future of modernization, with the future of that thing in India called inclusive growth. And so in the context of this rearranged world, not of the West and the rest, but of the BRICS and the rest, how then do we think about the global? What does that mean? And for me, it has meant returning, perhaps as a good student of Manuel Castells, inspired by that book of his I love, The City and the Grassroots, is to think about social movements and to think about the ways in which social movements are acutely aware of a rearranged and interconnected global south and global north. So I've been very inspired by the work, for example, of the Chicago anti-eviction campaign, which is working primarily in um, the, the, south, the, well, the southern peripheries of Chicago, if you will, in suburbs of foreclosure. There was a wonderful story in the New York Times about the work of the Chicago anti-eviction campaign and the ways in which they are trying to understand the relationship between suburbanization and financialization, but also the relationship with the changing urban poverty and new forms of suburban disadvantage. So in the film tonight, you saw images of the demolition of Cabrini Green. What the Chicago anti-eviction campaign has been doing is reclaiming empty and foreclosed homes in the suburbs of Chicago using adverse possession, using a very specific statute in the Illinois trespass laws that have to do with beautification, and placing what they call homeless people in peopleless homes, taking those who've been evicted from public housing or displaced through the demolition of Cabrini Green and placing them in these foreclosed homes. But what is also brilliant about their work is that they take their cue from the Western Cape anti-eviction ca campaign in South Africa, that they very explicitly advocate a politics of networked global solidarity, of horizontal solidarity, one that in fact is able to think beyond many of the divisions that often confound theory with a capital T, be it the divisions of rural and urban, financialization and urbanization, global north, global south, labor and property, and so forth. So perhaps what I'm suggesting as a provocation is that we have the opportunity in this rearranged world to think about the ways in which a very different type of theory, perhaps a more adventurous type of theory, is being produced by social movements that are in fact able to craft not only social change, but in fact a different kind of knowledge, are perhaps able to challenge the uneven ownership of the means of the production of knowledge. And if we take those, these forms of knowledge seriously, then we also have to recognize that what counts as critical theory has a lot of catching up to do in this global world. Thank you. Thank you, Shubert. Um, I know it's getting late, so I'll be very brief. But I have to thank Roger for your mass planning, the whole project, and for Sarah uh, for your effective coordination. And also I want to thank my colleague for your uh, wonderful collaboration and for your staying late. I know some of you are falling asleep. Uh, <laughs> I don't have much to say about global knowledge production, but in the next couple of minutes, I try to use suburb to contextualize our knowledge development. When Roger, you assign us a task to study Chinese suburb, uh, we felt it was impossible because there was no such suburb as we know in the American sense, suburb, there's no suburb as a distinctive category. So in the next couple of minutes, I'll 
uh, try to reflect on three questions. First is, where is suburb? Second is, what is suburb? Third is, what is suburban question? First, where's the suburb? Uh, it seems easy when you go out of the city before you reach the rural and you are in a suburb. But actually, it is more complicated than the physical definition. Uh, you should really map this in a sense of mode of governance. Uh, I said there was no suburb as a distinct category. It was true because in the period between 1949 to 1979, i.e. the socialist period, uh, people have a very wrong perception thinking China as an authoritarian regime. But actually, the power of the state was rather limited. Politically, it might be, but in terms of management, in terms of governance, the modern formal governance only reached the city boundary. The rural area, the vast rural area, was left uh, underdeveloped, self-contained, self-reliant, traditional society. And therefore, uh, even between the urban and rural, you don't have something in between. Physically, you may have state-owned enterprises, state-developed uh, industrial district, state-managed uh, farm, but they are all state system. When you go out of the state system, you have no state system. So it's an urban-rural dichotomy. But the second question is, what is urban? When Mr. Deng Xiaoping opened the door to the world, it really changed something, uh, creating the third category, the in-between. The in-between category as a way to the state extend its dominance by introducing uh, capital accumulation. I won't go into too much details, but you can see that in, in that sense, the urban and the rural uh, began to be integrated. Because in the city, you began to see rural migrants. We have just added a book uh, called Rural Migrants in Urban China. And in rural area, you also see the development of city. It's kind of an urbanization of the rural, demolition of villages, so the urban, the suburb is an interface, is a battlefield where the state extends its formal governance into the traditional leftover rural area. So the distinctive category has been created. And now the urban rural different mode of governance began to be converged. So now I reach my third question about suburban question. Is there a suburban question? What is a suburban question? Manuel Castell talk about urban questions as a question of collective consumption. And now we look at this way, you will see the, the suburb is really an interface where a new way of governance has been created, a new hegemony ha has been created. And through that way, there will be a one logic, a logic of state-controlled, state-dominated uh, by the way of capital accumulation to extend its formal control. So in a sense that you can see that I'm influenced by uh, Brenner's planetary urbanization. But really, I'm not interested in applying his theory into China. What I'm trying to make sense of Chinese context, which come up something you may feel resonated very much to the notion of planetary urbanization. So I think that's the way to, for me, because I know the context, I stick to the context, I try to develop something uh, more bottom up. That's the way, I stop here, thank you. Thank you so much, we've actually done a fantastic uh, to have these uh, 
scholars who are the frontiers of thinking and rethinking urban theory. And we actually have about uh, 15 minutes uh, to anyone who has any uh, comments or something on to respond or share some thoughts on these uh, very provocative and stimulating set of comments this evening. Or to each other. We're staging a rebellion. Summarize. Yeah. That's such an easy job. <laughs> I drop off the essay under my office door. I shall do that. I have a teach sheet here, but uh, any thoughts on uh, those of you? I mean, thinking, thoughts, uh, comments. I I think no. Uh, I, I, I don't even, uh, you know, uh, pretend to even uh, wrap this up because I don't think uh, these are actually more than wrappings. These are unfoldings and unwrappings which we are talking about. Uh, I think. Some of the, the takeaway points, if I can say to, as I do to my uh, lectures, um, the, the things which have become quite useful and all of us sort of seem, I think, seem to agree is the unknowability. And I think that's a very, uh, um, somewhere uh, uh, easy and a difficult claim to deal with, what is un un which leaves us very uh, uncomfortable. What does unknowability mean? And how, what would that, un how to research unknowability in a, in a very productive and generative way. In that sense, I think suburbanisms and global suburbanism becomes a generative site for new ideas and for thinking about emergent uh, conceptualizations. And to think about our uh, silences and gaps in theory not as speechlessness, but in terms of thinking of those very vociferous interventions to uh, rethink uh, theory with a small t and, and take ethnography quite seriously.